turn to Mark chapter number 10. you're born into this life, how much knowledge do you have of the truth? None. It doesn't come naturally, does it? Because the natural man can't know the truth, can he? So what's a natural man to do? When you're born into this life, what do you have in the way of resources? But as you grow, what begins to accumulate? <clears throat> Resources. How much knowledge of the truth accumulates? It doesn't, does it? That's a shame. So that leaves us with what? So what do you do about that? What are you holding in each of your hands? Money. What are you going to do with it? Do you know why you have it? Do you understand what it's for? So what do you have? Questions. You should have questions. How many of you have questions? Okay. Ask me a question. It's to use. Why did I get four and Sam got one? <laughs> Everybody gets different. What do I use it for? Hmm? You guys are pretending like you're in church. <laughs> what is it? Everybody gets some. To use. What is the purpose? I like that word, David. I like that word, purpose. Everyone that's born onto this earth should have questions. Because we're all born with resources, but no knowledge. Every one of you got something, and it's different amounts, and it'll, get, it'll take you so far, right? If you don't understand why you have what you have, you'll just burn through it till it's gone and you won't even know what the purpose was. You can do that. It's yours. It's your money. You can have it. But what are you going to do with it? You should have questions. What are you going to do when your money runs out? One question, right? You got so much money in your hand. It's not a lot, but it's something. What are you going to do when it runs out? Make more. Where you can't make it. Where did it come from? In this example came from me. You can't make more. It was given out. There's just so much. Hmm. Not enough questions. Can you ask me for more? Now we're getting to some good questions. One question, where did it come from? Okay. The person that gave it out. Can they give me more? Maybe they can. Who would you ask? The person that gave it to me. Okay. So this is what the person will get, that gave it to you will say. For every one of you that have resources, is that everybody? Yeah. If you put 
all of your resources in this jar, then not only will you get the money that's in the jar, whew, Okay, if you can get your money in here, you can trade it for everything else that's in there and even more. Okay, but you're stuck in your seat. So if you can make it, if you can make it in there, then you can have everything that's in this jar. Okay, so, so what did Josh have? He had another question. Guys, he's a fast learner. Can I bring the jar to you? No, the jar cannot be moved. Can I take your resource to the jar? I don't know. Let's see what Mark 10 has to say. You guys are on the right track. I was expecting money to just start flying. Really, and I saw it on some of their faces. <laughs> Did you make it? Did you make it? Did you make it? <laughs> now what do you have? <laughs> so, what, so what just happened? Wasted all of his living for a lack of understanding. Now what's he left with? In our example, he's dead. He's consumed all of the resources he was given. He has nothing left. His time's out. He wasted it all. Got nothing. What do you have to show for it? In our example, nothing, right? He wasted it all. Somebody else want to try to make it? You want to try? No, you're stuck. Now we laugh, okay? This is religion. What, what, what you're witnessing in the adults who aren't participating because they see how ridiculous it is, is religion. Okay? We've shared enough of a gospel that if someone even has... Now how many people are born into this life with their resources and they just burn through it, get to the end, and never knew what it was for? The vast majority, just burning through it, not even realizing the pile getting smaller and smaller, get to the end of their life, nothing. How many people are, have some knowledge? If I could get my money in that jar, then I could extend my life, you know, hundred, thousandfold. If I could just get my money in the jar. I know I have to get my money in that jar. So what are we doing? I'm stuck where I am. I'm just pot shotting. We could sit here until everyone, and this would be fun, but then you guys are going to have to help me clean up. We could sit here in this room until everyone in this room is dead and nothing left, and there would be not a single piece make it in that jar. Wouldn't happen. Right? That's what religion does. It offers a promise with an understanding, but the knowledge is broken. Right? I want you to turn to the book of Mark, chapter number 10. And the, I, the point is, what questions should we have? And why don't we ask the right ones? I alluded to this last week, this story, partly because it was on my mind as I was studying, and I wanted to share it uh, here this morning. We find in chapter number 10 of the book of Mark... A story, we're going to begin at verse number 13. It says, And they brought young children to him, that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased, and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. 
Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. Go thy way, so whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about, and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answereth again, and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray this morning that you might reveal your face to us as we study your word and we seek your face and your wisdom. We pray that your spirit might guide our hearts and minds into the things you have for us here today, Lord, and we know that uh, we have need to be ministered to from you this morning, Lord. If it's uh, nothing more than hearing uh, what I have to say, then we've wasted our time. We pray that your spirit might speak to each heart individually as the need may fit, Lord. pray that you just minister to us as only you can, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In this story, there's a lot of fascinating aspects, and I want to point out just a few of them. It starts with his discussion about children. And if you read, a lot of times we read the stories in the Scripture one at a time, right? And, and I think by doing that, we fail to connect the substance of what the disciples were experiencing as they were walking with Christ every day. Because he he tells them about children in verse number 14. And then he goes down, because it was, who was it that was rebuking those that brought the children? It was the disciples. Why? Well, because children are disruptive and they're noisy and they're full of energy and they're boisterous and they're inquisitive and ugh, right? They haven't attained unto, you know, the state of adulthood where we're just content and quiet and don't bother anybody so kids are a nuisance they have lots of questions and they interrupt and they don't know when to speak and they don't know when to be quiet they don't know when to stand up and when to sit down so they rebuked those his disciples did and then Jesus told them to suffer the children and not only so but he said whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a child shall not enter therein if you go all the way down to verse number 24 how does he address them after this discussion He says, children, (laughs) do you assume that might be related in some degree to the previous discussion? I think perhaps, because what were they struggling with? They were struggling with believing his word. He said that it was hard for them to have riches to enter the kingdom of God, and they were struggling with what he said. All that aside, the one thing I want to look at this morning of interest particularly to us is verse number 17. This gentleman comes to the Lord and asks a question uh, of great interest because I think even though he may not have thought it entirely through the way that we do when we read it and study it, he did in fact convey what most people believe, which is he asked, what may I do that I may inherit eternal life? I want you to suppose this morning that you know someone wealthy. Does anyone in here know someone wealthy? I mean wealthy, like really filthy rich. Like you go to bed at night wondering why they don't just give you millions because (laughs) they're filthy rich. If you knew somebody that had that kind of means and you walked up to them and asked them this question, what would they say to you? Because the question contains a uh, a great contradiction in and of itself. And I alluded to it on Wednesday, if you caught it. But in this question is a great contradiction of terms. Because on the one hand, he's asking, what may I do? And in the next breath, he's asking to inherit. So I want you to assume you know somebody filthy rich, and you walk up to them and you said, what must I do to inherit your wealth? What kind of a response might you get? You might get any kind of response. But the simple answer is, you can't do anything, can you? Because by definition, inherit is something you cannot do. 
inherit is something you receive by virtue of your position. So when you say, what can I do to inherit eternal life? He's on the right track, but he's still thinking in the terms of the carnal according to the law. Because what did the law teach? It taught what should be done. And mankind took the teaching of what should be done and turned it into what I must do. And that's not what the law teaches. It teaches what must be done, not what you should do. Do you see the difference? The law is for those who have kept it. <laughs> and for those who have not, the law is a penalty of death because you've not kept it. So the law is not there as a standard to teach us what must we do. It's there to show us what we have not done. Make sense? Thus the penalty is death. <coughs> Here Jesus has an interesting response because the man in himself is asking a contradictory question. What must I do to inherit? And just as our friend in our example might say, well, you can't do anything. That's reserved for my children, or it's reserved for my family, or it's reserved for whoever I put in my will, right? How many people have labored to get into someone's will only to be disappointed at the reading of the will? Okay, religion might teach us to labor to get into the will. And you might find yourself disappointed at the end of the road when at the reading of the will, your name is not found. So religion might invoke all kinds of behaviors from us to get in an attempt to get eternal life. Because in every relationship, and this is the way it always works, in every relationship, if you're in it for the fruits of the relationship or the end, that relationship inevitably will fail. If you're just trying to be nice to someone to get in their will, do you think they might get on to that? Probably. And actually, people with wealth tend to isolate themselves more and more because they get tired of people only interested in them because of their money. When the Savior comes to you and he makes this statement that, you know, whosoever will may come and drink of the water of life freely... Oftentimes, we fixate upon the reward. And that's what religion does. We fixate our mind on the reward, whatever that may be, and in every religion it's different, but there's a reward of some kind. And so you say, I want what? In this man's case, what did he set his heart to desire? He had set his heart to desire eternal life. Why not? If you're filthy rich, don't you want to live forever too? I mean, that kind of goes hand in hand. This guy was very wealthy. What was left for him? He set his heart not on riches. He had already gained that for himself. Now he had set his heart to eternal life. And he comes to the Lord asking, what can I do to inherit eternal life? In our example, if you ask the question that way, the answer would be, you must put all of your resources in this jar. Right? Right? I mean, that's the way the guy took it. You have to invest everything in here. Well, whose jar is this? Yeah, it's not yours. That's all he knew. Not my jar. I'm not putting my stuff in there. He said, you must take how much? All. all. So he starts out, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, right? So he started with what? The knowledge he had. He said, let's start with what you know. You know the commandments. And so he goes through the commandments, some of them. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. <coughs> and then Jesus, now do you think he answered that in a good conscience? I think he did. Can we live to the law of our conscience? No, we can't. Well, <laughs> we can. Is that going to lead us down the right path? No, it's not. You haven't been in my Sunday school class, so that's fine. But you are correct. You can live that way. It says, 
Uh, he's observed all these from his youth. Notice what Jesus says in verse number 21. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. Right? Just like we talked about last week when Jesus showed up at the synagogue and told the people what he needed to tell them. He's trying to show them what their problem is. What's the one thing in your life that will keep you from accepting Jesus Christ? Because there's something. Like for every unbeliever, there's something keeping you uh, away. And last week in our example, the Lord said, you know, a prophet uh, will not be received in his own country, and you're going to tell me this proverb, physician, heal thyself. And he told them all this. And they were immediately filled with wrath. Right? Some of you were here, you remember that. Here is a similar example. The Lord says, one thing thou, what? Lackest. So the contradiction in the question is, what must I do to inherit? The Lord's reply is, there's one thing you lack. He didn't say there's one thing you got to do. He said there's one thing you don't have. Right? If you're going to be in the will, if you're going to inherit, who does eternal life belong to? It belongs to Jesus Christ. If you're going to inherit it, how are you going, how do we know eternal life belongs to Jesus Christ? Let me just ask that. We'll start right there. What confidence do we have when he promises us eternal life? What, what, what guarantee or uh, proof or evidence do we have that he actually can have, that he owns and possesses eternal life? Tells us what? How did he prove it to us? Thank you. By his own resurrection. Okay, so people saw the Savior die, and he came back. If you had to cast your lot in with someone that claimed to have the power of eternal life, that's a good camp to be in, the person that's done it. He's demonstrated the power. Now all he's saying is eternal life is mine, Right? It is mine. And this guy says, what can I do to inherit it? He knew who to ask. He knew who had the power and the authority. He was a little vague on the particulars of how to ask. But he asked the best that he knew how. And the Lord gave him his answer. He said, one thing thou lackest. It's one thing you lack. Not one thing more you need to do. Not one box left unchecked on the membership card. Not something else you need to add to your bucket list to get there. That's not it. He said, one thing you lack. The one thing you lack. Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast. I like how he says just whatever you have. Like, it's nothing. Just whatever it is, you know, whatever you got, just sell that. He didn't tell him specifically, did he? He said, whatsoever you have, whatever you possess, go and sell that. Give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. If you were this gentleman, you probably didn't even hear the answer. He didn't hear the answer. He, didn't, he came with a question that was a good question. He came to the person who had the right answer, and he didn't listen long enough to get the answer. Isn't that sad? A man who was, he wanted eternal life. He came to the Savior asking for eternal life. What do we tell people in religion? Come to the Lord and ask. Repeat after me. He'll give you eternal life. This gentleman knew the person to ask, came to him and asked the question, but did not listen to the answer. Because he got his answer. But notice what happens. He had an emotional response to what the Lord began to tell him before he ever figured out what the answer was. And what happens when that's the case? Up goes the walls, right? Up go the defenses. Didn't even hear what you said because I'm, I'm so upset at the thought of what you were saying. I think that's what we have in this example. It says in verse number 22, he was sad at that saying and went away grieved. Now, if you had just come to the one who could tell you how to live forever, the one who could offer you eternal life, and you came to him and asked the question, and he gave you an answer, and he left grieved. 
Does that strike anyone else as odd as well? Kind of like last week, this is just bizarre insight into human nature. He went away. What, had, what was it that he had asked for? Because I think he lost sight of it as well. Eternal life. Eternal life. Does anyone understand the two words that are coming out of my mouth? Eternal life. Like all the other people on this earth you see dying, you could live forever. Live forever. How much do you have to fear about eating every day if you are have eternal life? Why do we eat? Out of fear of dying, right? I don't want to get sick and die. I have to. If you've already been promised eternal life, how much fear is taken out of your existence every day? Right? A lot. Chris knows. He talks about it all the time in his testimony. A lot of fear gets taken out of your life when you've been promised eternal life. Here he comes for eternal life to the one who has an answer, gets the answer, and he's grieved with the answer. Didn't even hear the solution to his problem. Why? Because he had great possessions. Before the Lord ever even got to the answer, I mean, before he even got to that, I said, one thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor. I guarantee you, before the Lord finished his statement, he had already begun grieving in his heart for the loss of his possessions and had quit listening to the rest of the answer. How do we know that's the case? He was asking for eternal life. He had had temporal things that he could exchange for eternal life. But he was grieved with the answer because he couldn't bear the thought of giving up what he had. If you can't bear the thought of giving up what you have, who was he interested in consuming it upon? So who was his God? Himself. He wanted to serve himself with his money. <coughs> the question is this. What's the very first commandment? Yeah, thou shalt have no other gods before me. God will not share his worship with you or anyone else. He's not going to share it. He wants to rule on the throne of your heart, to put it in modern religious speak terms. He wants to rule on the throne of your heart, and he's not going to share that place. He won't share. That's what this young man realized. It says that thou shalt have no other gods. He clearly demonstrated he loved himself most. He wanted his possessions for himself. He didn't want the poor to have them, and he didn't want to follow the Savior. He went away sad and grieved at, these, at this idea because he had great possessions. Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? Okay. So, everybody had resources, right? Some of our people have already wasted their living and they're dead. They're, there's no hope for them, right? When you're born into this earth, how much life do you have? Do you know? We don't know, do we? All we know is we spend a little every day. We just spend a little more every day. And what's happening to the pile? getting smaller and smaller, and we're wasting our living and spending our life away, getting down to the end of the pile, and we're perishing because we don't have an understanding. So if we're, to, in our example, what this man didn't understand is he wanted to keep his money and use it for himself. All he had to do was get his money in the jar, in our example, and he could have had wealth untold and lived forever. If you're going to lay up treasure in heaven, how are you going to get it there if you're stuck where you are? Jacob. Jesus can do it. What was Jesus' ministry to intercede? You're stuck where you are. 
and you've got resources and you don't have any idea what you're supposed to do with them because you're born into a sinful world. And the relationship with God we were intended to have has been severed by sin. So you're born into this life with stuff to use and you can't think of anything better to use it on than yourself. And that's what we do with it until the pile's gone and burn up and we die. The relationship was intended to dispense to you what you need every day. How much resource do you need if you got one of those little suction tubes to the bank right in your house? And you just walk up and you push the button and it goes, oh, my daily allowance from the bank. This is what we're talking about, only times a million. You can trade in your little garbage. What did you guys get? Nickels, pennies, a few quarters? Wow. How far is that going to take you? If you had that to live on, how far is it going to take you? I want you to put that in the scope of life. Your little vapor of a life in the grand scheme of eternity, how far can your own strength get you? Not very far under your own strength. Christ promises, if you give your life to me, then I adopt you into the family, right? I adopt you into the family. You become a joint heir with me. Now what can you inherit? Eternal life. And your money is hid with me, and I'm going to put it away, and it's going to continue to accrue interest, you could say, <coughs> until you get there. The question is, how much faith do you have in the intercessor? You see, this takes, this takes the, the point of fixation and, and puts it on a relationship with Christ because if eternal life is your only reward, I don't care how close you get, you're not getting in. If, if, if eternal life is the thing you're after, that it's probably not... Let's look at our example. All right? So what was this man after? Eternal life. But what happened halfway through the process? He was grieved. Why? Because the reservoir of human emotion... What, Jim? You know the answer. Yeah, it doesn't run very deep, does it? The reservoir of human emotion doesn't run very deep, and inevitably you will become discouraged or grieved or something with the process along the way. If you're only pursuing eternal life. How many people have we known? I'm old enough to have seen a lot of this in my life now. Who get interested in church, interested in religion, get all fired up, and they come and they go six months, a year, 18 months, train wreck. Why? Because they were fixated on the reward and they were pursuing it with their own emotion and it just won't sustain you. You will not see through. It won't get you there. The thing that we lack, okay, if you had the answer of the question, because this is, what the, this is the question we need to answer and we need to answer it really well. We need to answer it really well because our position is not any different than this young man. If the Lord were to talk to anyone on this earth today that was in search of eternal life, he would say, there's one thing you lack. Now from there, the explanation will vary depending on what your life consists of. But the answer begins the exact same for everyone that desires eternal life. One thing you lack. What is it that we lack? We need to know the answer to that question, right? Right? That's why nobody's wanting to speak up, because they're scared. This is a really important question. I don't want to speak up and be the person with the wrong answer. What do you need to inherit eternal life? Yes, you have to have Jesus Christ. If you're fixated on the reward that religion offers you, feel free to waste all your living until your life is over and never get accomplished what the Lord in his word seems to communicate can be accomplished. Right? Okay, I'll go, sell and I'll, I'll go sell everything and I'll give it to the poor and uh, that's what I'm going to do. Well, that's what this man needed to do. What do you need to do? Who's your God? What's in your way? Right? For the people that Jesus talked to in Nazareth, it was different. He didn't tell them, sell everything you have and come follow me. 
He told them, you're not going to hear anything I have to say because I'm from here. And what was the one thing in their way of gaining the Savior? The fact that he was from there and they wouldn't listen. So he's telling them what their problem is. He tells this man this. But the thing is the same. One thing you lack. Eternal life is a result. It's a result. Do you understand? It's not a, a goal. It's not a goal. It's a result of putting your faith in Christ. Eternal life to too many today is a goal in religion. It's a goal, and we've turned it into a game. Hey, see if you can make it in. I don't know. You move it around, right? Church hopping, the goals in different places. Can I get it in? Can I get eternal life? Eternal life comes to those who are in the family. You cannot be in the family apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. You must be in Christ. So what must we then pursue? We must know Christ. I, so in this example, this is a terrible example, and I hate doing this, but in this example, if I'm interceding and I'm the only one who can help you in this area of your life, then somehow you have to have personal interaction with me. Now, there's only, say there's only a couple of you in the room that even know me. What's the other people's hope? They have to talk to you. They have to talk to the people that know me so that they can even know I exist. What is mankind's problem? It's, it's a lack of understanding, right? We're born into this life with resources, and we don't know what to do with them, right? Like this guy, we assume it's to consume it on ourselves. So many people live their life that way. Right? I've got the strength, I've got the ability, and I assume it's just to use on me because I'm here and it's my life. We don't understand the relationship. So people that do know, you say, okay, good deal. I know. You have to call upon whom? Yeah, those who call upon the name of the Lord, right? My ears open. Those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right? That's a little different than, you know, repeat after me and you'll get eternal life. That's a, that's a goal, right? The gospel is not a goal. The gospel is Jesus Christ and faith in him. So the question is, do you believe? If you call upon my name, do you think I'm going to hear you? Do you think I'm going to come to you? Do you think I'm going to minister to you? This is where people are at. And that's the difference between believe, yeah, I believe Jesus, and believe. Because if you believe, what are you doing? Does anyone in this room believe right now? No, I mean really, like with me. This is for our example. Does someone believe right now? Thank you. Allison, I've been waiting ever since I gave this to you for you to ask me that question. How easy was that? What does it take? Take some humility. I'm going to put myself out there, and I'm going to believe. What did she just give me? Everything. What does she have left to consume on herself? Nothing. She's committed it all to the Savior. But what has she gained? She's got a direct line through the Savior to everything. Now, I know this is a little bit of a stretch, but I'm trying to take what we have turned into a repeat after me, you know, get eternal life, ride Jesus coattails religion, to an understanding of the desire he has to interact with you individually. Now, Allison could tell Jim about this guy she met, in our example, that took her money and exchanged it for, I don't know, how much she want? For the, for the pastor's money. Now, how much money does Allison have compared to everybody else? Wow. Is she going to tell people about that? I mean, I'm just... Assume what you have on is for real. Like, how much money do you have, Mike, in your hand, the money I gave you? A penny? Oh, you came out on the short end. 
she has 20 bucks. <laughs> and CJ took it. She has $20. What if you heard about that? What if you heard about a guy that somebody gave a penny and he was turning them into $20 bills? Now, why does that get us excited? Because it's money. And I hate even correlating spiritual things to money because it's a filthy example. But you get the idea of value in the temporal versus value in the spiritual. So Allison, what did she do? She called my name. What did she have to believe for that to work? She had to, she had to believe, one, that I can hear. Two, that I would respond. What do we have to have to call upon the name of the Lord in faith? You have to believe he's going to hear and believe he's going to respond based on the knowledge you have. Everything you know about this example is because I've told you about it. Daddy, that's pretty personal. Now watch this. It's kind of noisy. Did you see it go in? No. Do you think it's in? What if it didn't get in? I trust you. Oh, okay. She trusts me. She's latching onto the example. Right? When you call upon the name of the Lord, that's what's required, right? I'm not getting eternal life. What did this guy see eternal life as? Another possession for me. Not a relationship that's available to me through someone named Jesus Christ, because on my own, I'm dead. Your little pile of money is going to run out, and you're dead. Does that, is that clear? I want that to be pretty clear. You're born with so much life. It's a gift that's given to you, and it's running out, and it can be exchanged. That was the redemptive work of Christ. That's why he came. That's what he does. Because he loves you. He knows your t life is running out. He died to pay the price so that your life could be extended for all eternity. All that's required is enough faith on your part to call upon his name. Not to repeat after me and so I can get eternal life. Eternal life is not a goal. It's a result of being in a relationship with Christ. Because he is eternal. When I am in him, I now have eternal life. Does that make sense? I don't know if this is working for all of you, but I'm seeing enough to make me feel good that I tried. Like that you're putting this together. Like we've turned religion in our time into the goal of eternal life. Jesus Christ wants you to call his name in faith, believing that he will hear you. How are people going to know to do that? How are they going to know, Donald? How are people going to know to call upon the name of Christ? They're only going to know if we tell them. It's not a natural piece of knowledge. If I had just kept my silence, which is why I started that way, how many, how many people had questions with the money that was in their hand? How many people sought an answer from the person that was giving it to them? Nobody. Not until I began evoking some responses, right? How, that's exactly how this life is. People are born into this life. Huh, stuff. Guess I'll use it on me. Because of sin, we've lost that relationship. Originally, we were intended to fellowship with Christ, and every day he would dispense new mercies, new graces, new fellowship, new insight, new resources. Right? That's what he wants to do. This guy was asking the wrong question, didn't like the answer, and went away. How? So he knew, didn't he? <laughs> if he thought he was making a good decision, he would not have gone away grieved. Do you understand that? Our spirit testifies of the truth of what is going on. He would not have left grieved if he knew and had confidence that I made the right decision. He was grieved because in his heart he knew he was doing the wrong thing for the wrong reason, but he was envious enough and jealous enough for himself to make the decision anyway. Right? And what did he get to himself? He came for eternal life and he left with what? Worse than nothing. 
he got more knowledge, and now he had grief and sorrow added to what he already had. And that is the result of those who turn their back on Christ. When he says, I'm the way, he's not kidding. He's the only way. He is the truth, and he offers us life. He is the life, right? Eternal life is not a goal that we shoot for to try to get for us. He is the life. You have to be in him in order to have eternal life. Be in the family. Be written in the will, however you want to say it. And I know all of those analogies fall short in some way and in some areas, just like our example here falls short in some areas. But I want to try to make it tangible where you understand the difference between shooting for a goal of eternal life and calling upon the name of the Savior and having a relationship with him and trusting him with your life. Does that make sense? Let's have our uh, musicians come this morning. We'll have a word of invitation.